when maybe some of you were already <laughs> listening at conferences, we remember the bell outside, the real bell, but... Uh, You can. Grazie. Okay, so Edio is back, so I can now start. Okay, let's move to the to the. Okay, to the to this uh, last session of the of the uh, the conference, and I'm not going to say much about what they are going to talk now, but. I'm going to talk a little about them. So, uh, the first speaker in this uh, session of 2D materials is Suying Kwek, and uh, she comes from the National University of Singapore. She did her Singapore, uh, his uh, graduate studies in Singapore, mm -hmm. and then went to the U.S. when she had her uh, PhD. Uh, this is with uh, Imsimius Caxiras from Harvard and uh, Steve Louie from California, from the UCB. He, her, her, her thesis is in Harvard. And then uh, for postdoc, she went to, to, well, our dear Jeff Neaton. So she was there with uh, Jeff for the, for the postdoc. And she started with surface science, basically, and using DFT, GW, and plane waves. And then she moved to electronic transport, uh, looking at a single molecule junction. And uh, she has several very nice uh, papers that we can find uh, on the web about this, uh, this, uh, these uh, studies. And then now she's back at uh, National University of Singapore and back to, to surface uh, and to atomically thin materials, 2D materials. And she has a, now a, a, a group, a nice group of young people and uh, working mostly on the electronic structure of low dimensional materials for predicting uh, experimentally observable quantities, which is, I mean, we still have a link with the experimentalists. This is, this is really important uh, to explain phenomena and to predict and also implementing in-house codes to compute uh, Raman spectra, for example, resonant Raman, and developing new approximate easier just just to <laughs> just to get back to the old discussion could it, could it make it easier instead of uh, with more computers where is uh, I, okay i don't see nicola so <laughs> approximate uh, uh, methods for energy level alignment at surfaces that we know is really very difficult to do with our methods it's very difficult and, uh, and now, she's, today, she's going to, to talk about screening of quasi-particle excitations by atomically thin surfaces. So we are back to the molecule surface and, and thin surfaces. And the next speaker is Carlo Pignedoli. He, he did his uh, laurea and PhD work uh, in Modena with Carlo Bertoni and Rosa, PhD with Rosa Di Felice, looking mostly at molecule surface interaction, first at, the, at uh, uh, chlorine in gallium arsenide, and also how, how 
how does the surface of gallium nitride grows. This, is, this was his, his PhD. And he used this, um, well, DFT, GW, plain ways, also kinetic Monte Carlo. He has a lot of work about it. And then his postdoc was uh, in Zurich with uh, Van Andreoni. And then he moved to dielectric properties of uh, hafnium silicates, but now he's back. To, to, to molecule surface interactions, and uh, he's now at uh, Swiss Federal Laboratories for Material Science and Technology, meaning AMPA, that's how we, we, we say. And uh, when I say molecule surface, molecule is now as 1D carbon-based graphene nanoribbon, so it's, it's, a, it's not just, uh, just a simple uh, molecule, okay? And uh, now uh, he has also very nice uh, uh, papers with the group uh, with uh, looking at uh, nano, nano, nano wires. I have this, okay, formation of ultra narrow graphene nano ribbons and nano graphene. And he's looking at, uh, he has um, this collaboration. Uh, with experimentalists at AMPA and for fabrication of characterization of carbon-based 1D nanostructures. And so this now he's going to talk about on-surface synthesis of graphene nanoribbons from a computational per perspective. I now pass uh, the to Sue Wing and we start the session. Thank you very much, Marilia, for the introduction. And first of all, I'd like to say I'm so happy to be here in Trieste. I've heard about the workshops here, but this is the first time I am here. And I'd like to thank the organizers and as well as the Scientific Advisory Committee for giving me this opportunity. So today I'm going to tell you about some of our recent work on electronic screening by atomically thin substrates. So you, you have heard Professor Mazari's talk on 2D layered materials, and just to add that they come in a wide variety and different, with different properties. So uh, you can play Lego with these materials. You can stack them and get new properties. And nowadays in experiments, you can control the stacking sequence and even sometimes the stacking angles. Now, to twist this a little bit, uh, there is a rather old field of organic electronics as well. And if you combine the organic electronics field with the 2D materials field, uh, you could also have um, flexible devices with potentially interesting properties, such as the schematics that I've shown here. And these have also been realized experimentally in recent years. So the, the physical property that I'm going to be interested in looking at uh, in today's talk is the energy level alignment at the interface. So energy level alignment is very important because it determines the energy barriers for electron transport. And the question that we want to ask is what is the energy level alignment at the organic 2D material interface? Okay, just uh, some background. Yesterday, a few speakers talked about the image charge screening uh, method developed by Jeff Eaton, and uh, I'll just give some physics about that. So, oops. so basically, um, it is very difficult to compute the energy level alignment of large systems, and uh, quite more than 10 years ago now, uh, Jeff uh, came up with this method where he approximates the 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 quasi particle levels using this two step method. Right? So, first, we consider the DFT level alignment, which is wrong because the gap is too small, first of all. So, we correct that small gap using gas phase self energy corrections. Okay? This is the, the gap of the molecule in the gas phase. Okay. However, because of the presence of the metal substrate okay, and the fact that the HOMO and LUMO are actually the levels that you get from photo emission or inverse photo emission. Okay, so these, actually, for when you uh, measure these quantities, you actually create a charged particle, a quasi-particle in the material, 
and this charge gets screened when you have a metal substrate. So the screening of the charge okay, would, uh, for example, if you're measuring the whole mole, you remove the electron and you get a, get a hole. So the screening of the hole would stabilize the final state, and this would reduce the amount of energy that you need to get the, ele get the electron out. Okay, so as a result, the HOMO level is moving up. And similarly, the stabilization of the added electron will stabilize the LUMO. And together, you see that this reduces the band gap, the HOMO-LUMO gap. Okay. And uh, for a small molecule on a metal substrate, okay, we can... Uh, approximate this effect using classical electrostatics. Okay? So this is the polarization integral, which is the value of the um, self-energy from screening. And we can approximate the quantity here, delta W, which is a change in screen coulomb potential due to, uh, due to the substrate. By this quantity, V screen RR, which I define to be the screening potential from the substrate, due to a charge perturbation at R, and the response is also felt at R, where R is the position at the molecule. So you remove the electron forming a hole, for example, and you feel the effect at the same position. So this is the kind of screening effect that you'll be feeling for a simple system like this. And then we can approximate this using classical image charge screening, and it can be generalized to semiconductors with a dielectric constant. So the image charge approach is only valid in certain situations. Typically, the molecule has to interact weakly with the substrate. There should not be charge transfer because then you get dynamical screening effects. Okay, and the polarizability of the molecule should be much smaller than that of the substrate. And finally, you have the approximation which I just mentioned in the previous slide. And uh, we were motivated by this experiment in the, done in NUS where we had PTCDA molecules, which is this molecule here, which assembles in a herringbone structure on different substrates. And we want to ask to what extent does the 2D material tungsten disenonite, which is a semiconductor, participate in screening the PTCDA graphite interface and how does the PTCDA gap change due to this monolayer? So here is the outline of my talk. In the first part, first part of my talk, I'll talk about applying the image charge approach to this system, and this is published work in ACS Nano. Then in part two, okay, you'll find that in part one, uh, we were not quite satisfied with what happened. So in part two, I will uh, go further to talk about get, getting level alignment from the RPA electrostatic screening potential instead of the image charge approach. And this actually gives us additional insights into electronic screening by 2D materials in general, and also the screening of charge impurities beneath 2D materials. Finally, in part three, I will talk about how we are now able to do, get level alignment from GW that is adapted to large interface systems, such as the one that you saw in the previous slide. And we also apply it to PTCDA on silver, which is a prototypical system where you have charge transfer. Okay, so that's the first part of my talk. So these are some nice STM images that were obtained, and you can see the HOMO and the LUMO uh, here. Okay, and they are done on different substrates. And the nice thing is that the, the, the pattern is the same for all the substrates. And this is the result. So uh, this is the STS result, scanning tunneling spectroscopy, and this is what we calculate. And it actually looks not bad, much better than DFT. Okay, so with DFT, you get the same rather small gap on all substrates. And with the image charge approach, you get substrate-dependent homolumo gaps, and screening effects reduce the gap by about more than one EV. Okay, and to what extent does the WSE2 monolayer screen? Well, um, the easiest way to look at that was to remove the tungsten disenonite layer, which we did, and uh, keeping the graphite there. And that, that effectively increases the distance from graphite and gives a calculated gap that is much larger than any of the measured gaps. Okay, this shows us that the tungsten disenonite layer, although being atomically thin, participates significantly in screening 
the effect of excitations. And you can see that in another way, this is the change in the electrostatic potential when we apply an electric field. And here in tungsten dicellan light, you can see that the field is significantly screened. Okay, but, uh, well, if we look more closely at the numbers in the table, you can see that uh, there is a quantitative discrepancy. And they could be due to several effects. One is the neglect of molecular polarizability in these rather large molecules. And the graphite actually does not screen as well as a metal. And also the improper treatment of screening from tungsten diselenide. Okay, in particular for a 2D material, uh, what is the appropriate dielectric constant to be used in the image charge model? Okay, so this brings us to part two. So instead of using the image charge approach here with this approximation, we decided that we would just compute V-screen RR, the quantity I talked about, directly from ab initio GW calculations on the 2D material. Uh, uh, actually, essentially, we do, it, do an RPA calculation of the dielectric matrix and then compute V-screen. So before I go to the results, you might ask um, just intuitively, how does a suspended 2D material screen excitations above it? And in, in some approaches, uh, it is common to take an effective dielectric constant, especially in engineering, and it's quite quite effective to do that, to uh, consider the average uh, dielectric constant that you have from different parts of the system. And here with lots of vacuum space, that kind of approach would give an effective dielectric constant of about one, uh, which means it doesn't screen much at all. Okay. And uh, if you go back to the history on the literature of 2D materials, one of the most uh, interesting things about 2D materials was the large exciton binding energies in these systems compared to in 3D. And this is precisely related to the fact that you have much weaker screening within the 2D materials compared to within 3D materials. Okay, so, but what we find is that the screening of excitations adjacent to 2D materials is actually non-trivial. For example, the homolumo gap for benzene on monolayer hexagonal boron nitride is 8.4 eV, while that for gas phase benzene is 10.6 eV. And similarly, for work we have done on black phosphorus and hexagonal boron nitride, we find that HBN can reduce the quasi-particle gap in black phosphorus by as much as, uh, sorry, the in the exciton binding energy by as much as 11%. And this, to note that monolayer hexagonal boron nitride is a very wide band gap material. So we thought that there's something interesting there. And okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about the methodology. We said that we we're going to have V-screen computed in this way. So we do this using um, the codes that are implemented already in Berkeley GW, using plane wave basis sets and non-conserving pseudo-potentials. And of course, we, we need a slab column truncation cut off. Uh, so he, here are results that we have comparing the homolumo gap for benzene on different 2D material substrates computed with GW and um, with the approximate method where I used a, a variant of the image charge approach but with rescreen that I compute directly. So I, I, the comparison is not bad. You can see that the 3x3 three three cell, which we use for all these, may, may be a little bit small. And uh, when we use a 4x4 four four cell, we get actually better agreement. But what this tells us is, first of all, that you actually have an approximate way to, to um, tell what kind of a renormalization, gap renormalization you have without actually doing the whole interface calculation and simply just doing the substrate calculation. And you can do this for a variety of different small molecules. The second thing that it tells us that is that rescreen RR, which I have defined, uh, captures the effects of screening from the 2D material quite well. So we want to study this quantity a little bit more. And we have studied it for a range of different 2D material substrates that cover a wide range of quasi-particle gaps, and they are found in red. 
Okay, and we, we find a quite a good linear relationship between the quantity that we compute and the quasi-particle gap of the 2D material. And interestingly, for the 3D materials that we compute, we, these are like more than 20 over angstroms for the slab height. Uh, they actually fall, have the same linear relation. So this tells us that atomically thin materials screen the point charge perturbation adjacent to them, just as well as a 3D substrate with a similar quasi-particle gap, which is quite different from the contrasting screening within the 2D and 3D materials that I talked about before. So I will not show the details in this talk, but we can actually compute the induced charge due to the excitations and show that this is consistent with the fact that most of the induced charge is at the surface within two to three angstroms. Okay. So, so this is because screening is essentially a surface effect. Now, another uh, important uh, aspect of screening from 2D materials is the, was the discovery that thin film hexagonal boron nitride you know, was an excellent substrate, the substrate of choice for, for graphene. It was found that if you put graphene on hexagonal boron nitride, you reduce dramatically the charge, number of charged puddles that you have, and you improve the mobility in graphene. So this again suggests some kind of a non-trivial screening from hexagonal boron nitride, despite its large band gap. And experimentally, uh, people have tried to study this more fundamentally using electrostatic force microscopy experiments, where basically what is measured is Vs, which is a difference in surface potential between the top and the bottom of the slab. And they do uh, measurements for different thicknesses and get thickness-dependent screening properties of 2D materials. So here I emphasize that the charged impurities are beneath the 2D material substrate. They are on SiO2. And then you imagine that graphene is on top. And you want to know how, how well does the 2D material substrate screen out the effect of charged impurities beneath the substrate you know, for, for, some, for something that is on top. Okay. So we can, using our methods, also model these experiments using, uh, which we, and we use this formula here where we get the V screen at the top minus the V screen from the bottom. And then we average over in plane coordinates. And uh, we were quite surprised that when we did that, we actually got rather good qualitative agreement between theory and experiment for three different papers here. Uh, quantitatively, we did not expect to get exact agreement because it was already discussed in the papers that uh, you know there's charge impurities, there are absorbates, and, and so they actually thought that what we saw was not actually an intrinsic property of the material. But what we find here is that the qualitative agreement is quite remarkable, uh, which was nice. And uh, here I want to... Uh, talk a little bit more about hexagonal boron nitride. So in this paper in Nanolattice, uh, they, they concluded based on DFT calculations of dielectric constants, as well as fits to a 3D, the red one, 3D nonlinear Thomas Fermi model. It was suggested that the experimental data point for one layer HBN is an outlier, and it is due to increased charge transfer from an underlying water film. Okay. But um, according to what we have simulated, we do not think that the one-layer data point is an outlier, but rather the, it is part of the intrinsic property of HBN. So going back to how layered hexagonal boron nitride was a substrate of choice to screen out charge impurities, we have this plot here of the delta V screen, V screen at the top minus V screen at the bottom, the magnitude of that and compare MOS2 and boron nitride. And here you see that boron nitride, you know, if, if, if they are similar, then according to this line here, boron nitride should be somewhere here, or, or very small. The delta V screen should be very small, which means it doesn't screen very well. Okay? But we find that for its large quasi-particle gap, boron nitride actually screens charge impurities under it rather well. 
Okay, so this is consistent with the use of boron nitride as an excellent wide band gap dielectric substrate. Okay, so the summary of part two is that we have proposed a new methodology to compute the level alignment at small molecule 2D material interfaces where you do not need the large interface calculation. And along the way, we found that atomically thin 2D materials can screen a point charge perturbation adjacent to it just as well as 3D substrates with the similar quasi-particle gaps because screening is a surface effect. And so the implications of that are you can use 2D materials as effective atomically thin dielectrics. We also compare our results with electrostatic force microscopy experiments and we show that you know, what they observe, at least the qualitative trends, are really related to the intrinsic screening properties of 2D materials. And we also explain why layered hexagonal boron nitride is an excellent or at least we, we show that layered hexagonal boron nitride is an excellent white band gap dielectric. Okay, now finally in the last part of my talk, I will talk about level alignment from GW adapted to large interface systems. So uh, the parts one and two, actually the methods are quite simple and powerful. There are some uh, restrictions, right, as I had mentioned before. Um, and just to repeat, the molecule has to interact weakly with the substrate. Charge transfer should be negligible. Polarizability of molecule should be small. And, uh, well, as we, are, as we have heard from yesterday's talks, GW uh, is generally able to predict um, quasi-particle levels well and overcome the limitations that I listed in the previous slide. But the difficulty here is that it's actually very difficult to perform GW calculations on large interface systems such as PTCDA on substrates. And for example, when we use the Berkeley GW code, the bottleneck that we face is a memory requirement. Um, even for benzene on MOS2, we have a memory requirement of 7 terabytes. And this is largely re related to the inversion of the static RPA dielectric metrics of the interface. So just to give some background uh, for GW calculations, so the different parts of the calculations that we have, we approximate the self-energy using the GW approximation, and here we use the Berkeley GW code and the one-shot G not W not approximation. So the steps are, the first step okay, is to get a DFT mean field calculation of the Kuhn-Sham eigenvalues and wave functions, and then to calculate the dielectric metrics, the static RPA dielectric metrics. And as was mentioned yesterday, this involves the computation of chi, which is order n to the 4. And so memory requirement there is also large. And then the last part, which I call the sigma calculation, which requires a computation of sigma using the dynamically screened Coulomb interaction, which you derive from this uh, inverse dielectric metrics. Okay, so because of the huge costs of GW calculations, in the past there have been approximate GW calculations that have been proposed for interface systems, and primarily they are applied, applicable to weakly coupled van der Waals heterostructures. So here I list the two examples. So the first example attributed to uh, Christian Thekerson uh, is called the G delta W method, where you compute uh, a change in screen Coulomb interaction after you form the van der Waals heterostructure. And then you compute sigma step, which is a self-energy step, for the individual layer, so not the heterostructure. Okay, and then the dielectric function for the heterostructure is evaluated by combining that of individual component layers in their unit cells. The second method, uh, which was done by Professor Louis in Berkeley, was, is what I call the add chi method. So they compute a chi matrix for individual component layers in the supercell structure, then they add the polarizabilities of these different component layers to get an approximation to the polarizability of the heterostructure. And then they compute sigma for the individual layer using the approximated chi. So here we propose a different method, our, our approach, uh, which I call XAFGW for interfaces, 
it says for those step one, we have what we call an expand chi method. In step two, we have an add chi. And step three, we do full sigma, meaning sigma for the full interface. Okay, so in expand chi, we calculate the chi matrix for smaller unit cells for each component of the interface. So typically, if you have seen the PTCDA and WSE2 interface, there are many, many WSC2 uh, unit cells in there. So what we can do is to calculate the chi matrix for those smaller cells and then expand that by unfolding to the larger cell. Then in step two, we add chi okay, for different parts of the interface and we get the chi, approximate chi for the interface. And in step three, we compute sigma using the chi matrix of the interface and the full wave functions of the interface. So the first step will reduce the memory requirement and computational cost for chi in large n by n cells by a factor of m to the 4, which is a con considerable savings. In step 2, we add chi, this which we can show to be a good approximation even for hybridized interfaces. And finally, for full sigma, this enables us to treat dynamical screening, e screening effects and wave function hybridization in contrast to all the previous approximations. And our approach is built upon the Berkeley GW code with a plane wave basis. Okay. So uh, to just give some results, PTCDA on WSE2, um, in this slide I so show the gamma point result. Here you can see that the homostate is only 48% on the molecule, which shows strong hybridization. Using our method, we get a gamma point gap of 4.1 eV. If we do not do full sigma, meaning we do the sigma calculation with PTCDA wave functions only, we get 3.5 electron volts. If we use the V-screen method from part 2, we get 2.5 electron volts. And the experimental homo lumo gap for this system on graphite is 3.7 eV, and since graphite would screen out, it would reduce the gap even further, you know, these would definitely not work. Okay, here in this slide, I show the homo lumo gap that has been obtained from the projected density of states, and these are our results. So, um, here in today's talk, I have not yet done the full sigma with graphite, but only full sigma for PTCDA and WSE2. And this is the result that we get, which is in good agreement with experiment. And just to note that we have used a 28 electron pseudo potential for tungsten. So totally we have a 782 occupied bands here and a huge cell size and we still are able to do that. Okay, and finally, my last, last slide of results, PTCDA on silver is a huge system yeah, it's a, a prototypical system with large charge transfer where dynamical screening effects are important. Okay, I have a total of 20, 2,850 electrons from silver atoms. Okay, here are our results. So XAFGW, we get, I consider, very good agreement with the experiment. You can see the LUMO is partially filled. So, in summary, this methodology allows us to compute the GW quasi particle energies for large interface systems using a plane wave basis. So, the components of the interface can be molecules, semiconductors, or metals, and we include dynamical screening effects. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge the people who did the work uh, my PhD student Yu Jie Zheng, postdoc Yi Feng Chen, and postdoc Kian Nuri, student Nicholas Ching, and Postdoc Feng Yuan Xian, and they are here in these slides. And I acknowledge funding from National Research Foundation and Ministry of Education. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>